Okay, so um, good afternoon to everybody. Good morning. Um, if you're in America and other parts of the world, um, thank you so much for joining this um, webinar on how to accelerate accelerate evidence for uh, technology appraisal approvals with the National Institute of Health uh, Research, which is the NIHR. And for many in the US, you'd know there's a similar organization called the NIH. Ours is better, we'll find out. Um, so I'm delighted to, to be doing this. I've been a great fan of the NIHR for, for many years, having worked closely with them and helped to uh, direct um, many of my clients through to is this great organization which is funded um here in the in in the nhs in in, in england um i'm delighted to be joined by uh, jane sol introduce and some other folk who have had great experiences with their medical devices and using the nihr to help them along the way so we'll go into more detail with that um so I'm Mike Brannigan Harris, um, CEO of Device Access. Who are we? Uh, we are a market access, access consultancy firm. Uh, we set up uh, in the UK back in 2010. So we're coming up to 11 years old. And in that time, we've helped lots of companies navigate their way into this complex healthcare system, the NHS. Um, so we're very focused and what we like to do is try and help companies to get great technologies to patients faster. And that's our mission. So how do we help companies? Well, several ways. Um, we have helped over 40 companies through NICE and NICE are a very well respected HTA body um, who basically help to tell the NHS whether products are safe and cost effective and give advice to patients, providers and payers in terms of what's best and what should be used. Um, so we help to guide, patient, uh, help to guide uh, many companies through this uh, NICE organization. Um, we are also um, very proud to be uh, what's known as a meta tool facilitator. So we have a license with NICE and we're able to help companies understand where they are in their evidence um, scenario. So whether they've got good enough evidence to go through NICE and it's a service called meta tool. And, and as part of that, we often find clients who do need to develop evidence and do need to get more um, efficacy data, cost data, etc. And that's where uh, having the NIHR here um, to help to signpost them in, in the directions of, of getting that evidence is, is so important. So, so, um, so that's uh, one, one aspect of the meta tool, but it is really helping companies understand the, the gaps in their evidence and, and helping them to go out and develop that uh, so they have a successful journey through, through NICE. Um, we also have a license and have done now for coming up to seven years with the uh, with NHS Digital. And NHS Digital um, stores all the electronic um, patient records of everybody treated in English hospitals in the last um, many years. We've got four years of access to this data and it gives us a very, very good insight into how patients are treated, um, what's wrong with them, um, uh, what, what those um, episodes of care mean for the patient, the provider and the payer. And, um, and that gives us a real good understanding of, of PICA, which I'll talk about next. All of this work though we do is to help our um, clients um, accelerate the adoption and, and get, uh, get the, these great technologies to patients faster by improving um, engagement with hospitals and really being able to demonstrate the value that they bring to the system and to the patient. So market access is a complicated thing. Um, uh, we've sort of made this bit up. But, but we have had quite a number of success stories over the years. Um, some of them have hit the news. Um, uh, this one, for example, with a new treatment for prostate, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia that we're proud to be involved in. So when you uh, come to any healthcare system, um, you know, you really do need to understand uh, the population who needs it. Uh, you need to understand um, how those patients are managed today. And when you apply your new intervention to them, we need to understand what the outcome differences are. So what's the benefit of using the new intervention, your technology on the population versus the comparator and what happens today? And a lot of the work we do at Device Access really is helping companies to understand who needs it, what happens today, and help them to build the evidence around the outcome benefits. And, and that is all through various means. And again, um, having um, access to great uh, ways of generating um, evidence with the NIHR is what we're gonna focus on today. Um, as you go into the journey of market access, we've also devised this, what we call the principles of market access, which are uh, being able to demonstrate that your product benefits the patient, the provider, 
and the payer. And that's really important. Um, the old adage of using marketing, product price, place promotion in, in helping to try and sell uh, you know, goods doesn't really work with medical devices because they do have a big impact on patients' lives above all. But um, the complexities of healthcare systems um, and the way that they're financed and managed means that we really believe that these principles have been able to help you to show that your devices benefit the patient, the provider and the payer, and also that your product, your business should benefit from being out there and getting to as many patients as possible at a price that's justifiable is again the work that we do here at Device Access. So um, that's enough from me. Um, I, uh, I have my uh, panellists here today. One of them we're waiting for. Um, uh, we're not sure where he's gone, but we've got, uh, we've got enough and we're going to be fine. So uh, we've got James Richards, who will be talking um, next about what the NIHR is and how it works. Um, Michael, delighted to have Michael here. Uh, Michael and I go back several years and he'll tell you about uh, where we originally met, but um, he's a co-founder of a company called uh, Inavia and, um, and we'll be talking about how uh, the NIHR have helped him. Marcus is here. Um, uh, he's the co-founder of Alpha Biomics um, and we are waiting for George but we're not sure whether he is he may be stuck in traffic not sure but uh, what I'll do without any further uh, delays is I'll hand over to uh, James who will be talking about the uh, the NIHR and then we'll open up the conversation uh, please feel free to fire questions on the chat box over to you uh, James if I hit stop share which I should be able to do here there you go over to you Thanks, Mike. So just let me know. Um, if that's visible. Very clear. Yeah. Wonderful. So thanks, everyone. Um, obviously, my name is James and I work for the NIHR. Uh, my role is focused on supporting industry from across the world to navigate the NIHR's landscape. And as Mike said, we've got two examples of such companies here today. Um, what I really want to do is give you a very quick run through of what the NIHR does, particularly for medtech and industry and how we can support companies to develop their innovations and to gather the evidence in particular um, that Mike said is so important um, to progress towards market. So we are a unique virtual organization set up by the Department of Health and Social Care over 10 years ago. We're tasked to improve the health and wealth of the nation through clinical research and we're the largest funder um, in this area in the UK. Our budget is invested, as you can see on this slide, in a variety of different areas. The majority of the spend goes to what we call infrastructure, which is universities, NHS trusts and clinicians. And we think of this as funding their time to enable them to do research, either academic led or in partnership with industry. Um, about 250 million pounds of this budget goes into funding programs, which I'm sure will be very relevant to today's audience. Um, some are tailored specifically to industry and even further more specifically to medtech R&D. Um, there are some other uh, suitable funding streams as well, the NHR supports, which um, can be accessed with industry when collaborating with an appropriate institution. And I think it's important to consider the UK on the international stage. Um, when you consider it, according to clinicaltrials.gov, it's maintained this position in second place as the world leader for commercially sponsored studies. Um, if you look at the data since 2018, and more specifically, if you drill into medtech, we've recruited over 13,000 patients for medtech studies, and 83% of these recruited to time and target. You know, and over the last sort of five years, over 3.6 million patients have been recruited to studies um, up to last March. So if we move on to the next slide here, what you can see is a very sort of rough flow of the innovation pathway and how you can move your med tech innovation towards market and evaluate a number of things, including you know, the impact on the care pathway, uh, the clinical utility and how um, it's used in a clinical setting, its performance, um, also the cost effectiveness in comparison to other existing standards of care or other technologies. And if you follow these steps, um, it should lead you to producing evidence, which hopefully forms a robust case that your technology has created patient benefit and is cost effective to organizations like clinical commissioning groups and NHS trusts by consider adopting your technology into clinical practice and importantly, reimbursing it. And this really shows where the NHR's remit is, which is in this evaluation and evidence gathering phase. And we start to talk to companies in particular as sort of the late preclinical, um, when they're looking and starting to explore how they're gonna move further down this pathway. 
In medtech, it is slightly different, I have to admit, in comparison to, say, therapeutics. And we do get requests for clinical input into the design of technologies, how a technology could be uh, used in a care pathway, what's the appropriate sort of moment to look at doing some of these um, stages, including sort of developing your next stage of prototype. And what's important to, I think, consider here is that getting clinical input at the right stage can be crucial because you don't want to develop something that um, simply isn't fit to work in an NHS setting. You know, if it can't be used with gloves or the batteries need charging every uh, three or four hours, you know, it's just not going to be um, practical. And finally, on this slide, um, it's worth mentioning there are many organisations in the UK that can support uh, the needs and stages in the innovation pathway. And the NHR, as well as the vice axis, of course, can help you connect into some of those. So the offer to industry from the team that I work in, particularly uh, when engaging with industry, focuses around these six particular elements. We interact with lots and lots of different companies. And what I'm going to do is try and expand these slightly to give you a little bit more uh, of the specifics around the support we can offer. Um, if we break them down, you can see at this more granular level, we speak to lots of companies to help them understand what the NHR can offer. And from their perspective, it enables us to give an opportunity to try and distinguish their needs from a clinical research perspective or a health economics one. And you'll see here that there are lots of um, support available when you look at things like NHR expertise and funded centers and NHS trust. We can help to find experts to help with things like study design, access specific facilities to conduct the research. And one thing that's particularly important, I think, is that this service can be used to help you find a clinical champion for innovation, which can be a hugely beneficial thing when trying to get adoption at the sort of later stage. You'll also see that we can support with connections into trial management through the NHR's clinical research network, identification of the funding programs, <laughs> and also things like accessing organizations that might have relevant data, particularly if you're a, a digital or AI technology, you know, you can run existing data sets through your algorithms if you know where to try and find them. And then obviously crucially important for things like IBD companies, you might want to be looking for patient samples or, you know, any company might want patient involvement into their med tech innovation journey. So I think from the NHR's perspective, the jewel in the crown is the MedTech in vitro diagnostic cooperatives. There are 11 of these. They're hosted by leading universities and they act as a national network across disease and technology areas to support medical devices, digital technologies. And now and now, I think more often are using AI based technologies to support them. Um, they have a core team, each MIC, that is comprised of statisticians and MedTech specialists, and these help to build robust studies that can support with things like human factor assessment, uh, identifying evidence requirements, or things like usability testing for regulatory submissions. Each MIC, as we like to call them by shorthand, has a different research interest. Uh, examples include cardiovascular, um, surgery, for example, and brain injury. And you can see you know, all of the centers here on, on the slide, and there are three that focus exclusively on in vitro diagnostics. In addition to the mix, um, a large amount of research funding goes into biomedical research centers. There are 20 of these across the country and they are similar in the fact that they are university and hospital partnerships. They focus on early phase clinical research and translation of innovations, therapeutics and med tech into the clinic. Uh, they have a broad and varied collection of research themes based on the expertise in their local area. And I think what we see when we support companies to access expertise is that quite often um, we get expressions of interest back from both MIX and BRCs. And what is really nice is the projects can develop where both sets of these expertise collaborate together with industry. They form a multidisciplinary team. And, you know, it can be that a BRC and an MIC located on the same campus can collaborate, but this happens across the country as well. So it's a very strong offering. If we move into kind of data provision, we see a lot of companies looking for things like tissue or samples. Um, certainly, where organizations in the UK through NHR and other infrastructure are funded, they can support the needs of industry and we can help to navigate this area. A couple of really interesting examples are NHR Bioresource, which has cohorts of patients that have been genotypically and phenotypically characterized and already consented to be contacted about uh, future research studies. Um, also when looking for data, you know, there's a few examples on this slide here of organizations that can support whether it be primary or secondary care data or even real world evidence data that you're looking um, to access. So very quickly, this is a funding snapshot of the UK MedTech landscape. The NHR focuses here on the uh, three particular programs. There's the Invention for Innovation, which supports R&D um, and is a translational funding program for MedTech. 
efficacy and mechanism evaluation, which is co-funded by the Medical Research Council and supports clinical studies to assess the efficacy of an intervention. And then finally, if you're a little bit closer towards market um, and you have evidence of your uh, intervention's efficacy, you might want to consider this program, the HDA, because it can help you to gather evidence of clinical and cost effectiveness in comparison to best alternatives within the NHS. So I'll spend a little bit more time briefly talking about um, eye for eye because it's a very popular program and in particular of interest, I think, for SMEs. Um, it's really designed to support from the proof of concept to commercialization of technologies um, and even ones that are commercially available but lack sufficient evidence for uh, supporting adoption within NHS. There are three funding streams that underpin the program. Connect, which is really, really a perfect opportunity for SMEs to consider. They're short duration projects up to 12 months, small amount of funding at 150k, but a very broad remit from you know uh, commercialization and, and development. And uh, it's a quick turnaround, which would be all pleased to know. You know, it's, it's three months from application to award. PDA is the flagship program. Um, it's for longer duration projects up to three years uncapped awards um, as long as costs are justified. You do need a collaborator from an NHS trust or a higher education institute, etc. but it will support things like uh, regulatory um, work for CE marking or IP and commercialization activities, as well, of course, of, you know, clinical studies and health economic activities. <laughs> Finally, we've got the Challenge Award. So if you've got a regulatory approved technology, but as I mentioned before, you need that evidence to support the uh, adoption, then Challenge can be uh, of particular interest. The focus can switch depending on NHS needs, but it currently is directed towards real world implementation. And Challenge and PDA both have a slightly longer time frame um, when looking at applications. <laughs> So I'll very briefly mention the uh, support that NHR provides to the NHS England funded AI and Health Care Award. I'm not going to go into detail today, but if you want more information, please do get in touch. It supports a range of development from feasibility to initial health system adoption. But I mention it specifically because it has a slightly broader remit for digital technologies where the i for i programs do not support, you know, wellness apps or things like that, or even some service improvement element. Um, the AI and Health Care Award has a slightly broader remit. So it's worth noting the distinction between the two. So moving towards sort of the delivery aim of, of the NIHR the <laughs> research network. And as I mentioned, it's there to support academic and commercial studies from an industry perspective. Once you've got your funding for protocol, um, they can help you set up and deliver the research. It comprises of a national office and local networks that are distributed across England, and it enables a detailed understanding of the local level of patient populations and the care pathways. Um, it works also closely with the devolved nations, so it can be a one-stop shop for clinical research in the UK setting. It supports all types of clinical research, as long as there's a strong research question, has some patient benefit, and ethics is approved if required. Um, the support is structured around the study support service, which you can see here um, in the diagram. And all of these components are free for industry to access, except the patient engagement and clinical development, which employs a cost recovery model. So just to wrap up, I'm just reiterating the point and the part of the innovation pathway that the NHR supports <laughs> the industry using all the components I've mentioned. The aim is to support the generation of clinical and economic evidence required for market adoption. And then very finally, this is kind of a summary slide that shows you all the services that we provide to help you navigate um, the support the NHR offers and to connect you to other relevant organizations across the UK system, to support your medtech innovation uh, development. And if you've got any questions, please do uh, feel free to get in touch. Great. Um, well, thank you for that great overview. I know there's a lot of slides there and a lot of information. I try and condense it into three things and we can talk about the journeys that I've uh, taken companies on when they've, when, when they've uh, you know, uh, been, uh, you know, interested in coming into the country and, um, and asking, um, you know, for some advice and support in getting in front of the right people and getting funding and getting the studies going. Um, so we'll, I'll go into that in a bit more detail. We had a couple of questions actually, and I, we might just answer these straight off. Um, uh, Kate's asked, is there a cooperative that focuses on nursing practice and device innovations, um, James? So I guess they all focus on device innovation. So there are some that focus more on ambulatory care, which might be more appropriate for nursing practice, I guess it depends on whether uh, Kate's thinking about primary or, or secondary um, nursing care there. But there are further connections that we have, not just within the, the MedTech and Vitro Diagnostic Cooperatives that I mentioned, but other organisations that we uh, 
can interact with and support companies to access, you know, around care homes, for example, in Rich um, is also part of that as well. So probably we need to have a little bit of a chat to understand a bit more, but I'm sure there's something that we can probably help with there. Yeah, and another question, and this is this is an interesting one from an anonymous person um, asking, as a medtech manufacturer wishing to, to fund and generate higher quality evidence uh, in the UK for innovative technologies, UK clinical trials units have recommended working directly with them rather than going through the NIHR. Uh, this is because of the extended timeframes to get the evidence generation um, when going via the NIHR. Now, I, I can honestly say, um, you know, my view on this, um, you know, is that I've brought, I, I've met with lots of companies that have gone direct to clinicians in the NHS and have tried to start, start doing studies uh, directly with those hospitals and, and found it's taken a long time. And, and also it's about finding, you know, you talked about the clinical champions um, and this great infrastructure that the NIHR offers. And my, again, Michael and, uh, Michael and Marcus will, will talk about their experience in a second, but um, I can honestly say that whenever I've put anybody in touch with the team at um, Notcree, and again, it's the National Office for Clinical Research Infrastructure is the is the front door for research as I see it in the NHS. Um, and and if you don't know about Notcree, and that's partly why I wanted to do this um, uh, this, this meeting was was to really highlight who the this organization are that really are there to help the medtech companies uh, navigate this complex infrastructure to put them in front of clinical champions to help them with funding and and to really shorten that time and i know that the time scales james that, that are set from uh, notification uh, to you to just to, to, to doing studies there, there is a, a very strict timeline there isn't there james yeah definitely so through the signposting service that nocri supports um, we, we require completion of a form that we call a NEF for short. Um, it's, it's sort of a 14 day turnaround from us receiving that to sending back any expressions of interest um, that we get from industry. It's probably worth pointing out, it can be a little bit longer in the times of a coronavirus pandemic, but we still have seen good interest from researchers across the country, actually, in particular through the second wave. Um, the Clinical Research Network, when they do UK feasibility, they have set timelines that work toward two or three weeks, depending on site identification and further feasibility. So all the industry facing teams have strict timelines to try and provide a, a strong level of service support. Yeah, no, that, that's that's really great. So I really appreciate that, uh, that uh, great introduction, James. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, sat in the background here. We've got we've got Marcus and we've got Michael. Starting off with Michael, um, love to uh, you, you to introduce yourself and, and tell us about what your company does and how you got involved in the NIHR. Well, thank you very much, Michael. I I had the pleasure of meeting Michael about maybe ten years ago when I was working uh, for the National Innovation Center for the NHS and. Uh, he brought to the, the National Innovation Center technology for uh, venous vein uh, treatments, which was quite uh, transformative. But I found it really interesting, his model, because it's exactly what he was presenting, where he had a product or technique, uh, and then he found a clinical champion uh, who was an advocate and looked at the benefits to the patient and then the benefits to the provider, the NHS, and then figuring out how to pay. And... Um, his company has been very, very successful and is very pragmatic in the way uh, Mike uh, navigates companies through the NHS, which can often appear very uh, uh, complex. It's one of the world's largest health uh, services. Uh, and I left the NHS after working for 10 years and I set up my company in Navia. And we focus on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, I started working in Singapore and, and Brazil and then some people from the UK said, why don't you try to do something in the NHS now? And so I put in an application to the Office of Life Sciences to take my technology to the NHS. And we won uh, a grant from the uh, gover British government to look at the use of the avatar technology in the NHS. And uh, the NIHR actually reached out to us then and asked uh, for a meeting. So I, uh, I went to see, uh, uh, James's colleagues to talk about what we were doing and uh, an amazing amount of support and insight in, in terms of how complex the, the NHS is, but how then to navigate your, your, your way through this. And one of the things that they said was, why don't you put in, um, uh, use our signposting service, which is what James just mentioned. So we filled in a very simple form, applied, and it went on to their signposting service. And then uh, within a few days, 
there were people responding, ding, ding, ding. And uh, the ones that I took interest in was Imperial College, Imperial College University of London, um, BART's uh, Healthcare and Leeds Teaching Hospitals in Leeds. Uh, there were clinical uh, champions, professors at each of these um, very famous hospitals that wanted to talk to me about using Avatar in, in trials. So I went off to see them. And uh, to cut to the chase, what happened in each one of these hospitals, we then together put in a proposals to do uh, uh, research, evidence-based research projects, which are now running and they're, they're funded uh, uh, at Imperial, at Bart's Hospital, and at Lee's Teaching Hospital. And they've now led to much larger studies. There's one, a very large study I'm doing with Imperial, and we're looking perhaps to go to India on a, a much larger study related to COVID. And my, um, my message to people who, who run SMEs or even large corporations is the NHS is massive, it's very complex. And uh, what NIHR does is it, 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 it clears the fog. There are experts there that understand how to work through the system. There's a whole infrastructure in place. And the NHS is fantastic in terms of mobilizing around uh, particular opportunities like what we have with product development. So I'm a strong advocate of NIHR and I'm very, very pleased to be here to say that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michael. That's, uh, that's a great, uh, thank you for the kind words you said about, about me as well. That's really much appreciated. But, but I think that's, that's the thing is, you know, we have lots of hospitals, lots of clinicians, lots of opportunities where we've done well through COVID, certainly in, in the research side. And, and I think that's, you, you're not the nail on the head as I've always found by putting people in the front door of the NIHR, the Nokri office, it's always helped to, to get in front of those investigators and that, that's great to hear that you, you managed to do that and get um, you know, get such a, a good, yeah. uh, fast response and, and set, set the trials up because this is all, this is what takes time. So thanks yeah. so much for the introduction there. So across to you, Marcus, um, I'd love to you please introduce yourself and, and explain how, how the NIHR um, uh, uh, Nokri helps you on the way. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. And thanks for including me um, in this panel as well. Um, so we are a UK-based startup, um, and um, we are developing um, a diagnostic for patients suffering from inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. And the test will um, analyze a patient's stool sample to predict the likelihood of uh, response of that patient to powerful um, but expensive biologic drugs that work in many patients, but uh, also do not work in many, many other patients. Um, and when we founded Alpha Biomics, we really started off just with an idea for this diagnostic test based on uh, literature. Um, and then with the help of the NIHR signposting service, um, similar to what uh, Michael said earlier, um, we really connected, we found um, champions of a diagnostic, um, like the one we wanted to develop, people with similar conditions, with similar interests uh, in, in the space. Um, and these discussions really helped us to understand the IBD care pathway um, in the UK, to understand the clinical disease score, um, to also confirm the need that, uh, uh, for a diagnostic like that. And importantly, also really to identify and find uh, collaborators um, for our research program. Um, and we use the, the, um, the signposting service recently again for uh, a similar approach in a different disease indication. Again, we got um, several responses from interested clinicians. So it's really a great, great service and I would recommend, uh, recommend it to, to anyone. Um, we were also fortunate enough to receive funding from NHR from the um, I4I program that James just mentioned. Um, and in our current uh, I4I product development award, we are collaborating with, or our main UK collaborator is the Biomedical Research Center. Um, and uh, we are also working or collaborating as part of this program with the AHSNs. Um, we are a little earlier maybe for the AHSNs, but we also connected to them because I think it's important to also look ahead and really understand you know, um, the, the, the place where you want to go to. Um, and so we're working, we're a bit more in, in loose contact with AHSNs, but it's also a great resource to understand where do we have to actually get to in order to get implementation dissemination in the AHSNs. That's great. Thanks, Marcus. I, I think that's, uh, you, you summed it up. It, it's, it's quite difficult if you turn up in a country and a, a healthcare system like the NHS and, and you, you have some ideas as to who those thought leaders are, but to send a message out um, from the company saying, I'm Marcus from this unknown company 
um, will you will you talk to me about a study is 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 you know the inboxes of these clinicians and thought leaders uh, are, are, you know they're, they're really busy people and I think that the the credibility of of getting it through the whole the, the NHS body itself with the NIHR being you know there to to do and make those introductions um, makes uh, makes those responses um, far more uh, you know you get a far quicker response I know for me one of my clients um based in the Netherlands wanted had been trying to connect with a, a thought leader in the area of, of delirium for about two years had no uh, response from emails and phone calls and secretaries etc and then one meeting with the team at the, in the NIHR at Nokri um, led to uh, it going out a, a request for um, across the country for experts interested in doing research in delirium and and within two weeks uh, that very delighted client was was actually connected to the thought leader the leading person in London and and you know they were delighted that, that they were able to do it and then it was a free service so that's the other thing is that mm -hmm. the services of the NIH are free uh, and and you know it's their job to to connect you with researchers and funding so it's a great thing so George uh, you brought here in the end I know you're on mute at the moment um, I'll just uh, introduce uh, George who's um, the uh, uh, co-founder and CEO of Medisieve um, uh, George please introduce yourself and, and explain how uh, how you got involved in this and, and how the NIHR helped you yeah, thank you very much, Mike. I apologize to everyone for being uh, a little bit late, but hopefully I'm not too late. Um, so uh, at Medisif, we're deve uh, developing uh, a platform therapy for critical patients suffering from hyperinflammation. So that includes uh, patients suffering from sepsis or, or COVID-19 or cytokine storms. Um, and it is a, uh, a tool that we call magnetic blood filtration, and it provides doctors with the ability to specifically remove IL-6 directly from the bloodstream of patients. Um, and it's a tool that we have ambitions to develop into a platform to remove other clinically relevant targets. Uh, so we're, we're a UCL spin out. Um, and so we already had a little bit of kind of help and advice and, and pointers when first starting the company. But I think I've got to echo what um, uh, I think it, uh, Michael said earlier is that, you know, the, the NHS is a, a huge and complex beast and system and um, it's one of those things where you have the typical knowledge curve you, you think you understand this and then you start to look into it a little bit and you realize that you really don't understand it at all um, and then you get a little bit deeper and you suddenly start to unpick exactly how how everything works um, and, and how ultimately you can work with the system and, and individual trusts uh, and the players within that system to, to drive whatever it is you're developing towards clinical trials and and hopefully eventually towards the clinic and and towards the market because that's got to be the end objective of of, uh, of what everyone's doing um and i you know i think that the the nihr and and knockery are, are particularly valuable services in helping to figure that out and helping to get down to the granular detail and to introduce you really to the people that you need to see at that time so for us the really valuable thing was that introduction service to clinicians and collaborators uh, one of those led directly to a, a uh, research collaboration uh, with uh, with um, someone who was already working specifically in the area that that we were we were looking at um, at the London School of Hygiene and, and Tropical Medicine, and that was uh, incredibly fruitful for us in terms of very cost effective uh, research collaboration. Um, obviously, the service cost nothing, but what I mean is we were able to generate some really useful results far more, more cost effectively than we would have done if we'd gone through a CRO, for example. Uh, and the other but more valuable one was actually uh, an introduction to a clinician who has um, now agreed to, to be the principal investigator on an upcoming clinical trial. Uh, we've actually secured some NIHR grant funding from this for this clinical trial to look at it um, in COVID. Uh, and um, this clinician is, is providing um, absolutely invaluable expertise, know-how, um, and advice uh, to help us uh, build up all the elements that are needed uh, for the clinical trials to, to be a success. Um, the details of the protocol, the clinical trial design, the inclusion criteria, the endpoints, all these areas where um, <laughs> I was going to say I'm not an expert, but uh, I'm, I'm barely even an amateur still at, at this stage. So, um, and that was, you know, really off the back of a, of a, of a, single, a single meeting and a couple of introductions. 
Um, so, so the value of that um, is uh, is immeasurable, really, because it's just uh, essential for the success of the company. Um, so, for us, those have been by far and away the most valuable things. Um, but I, I, I'm aware that there are there are other services that people have spoken to, um, and uh, yeah, can anyone out there trying to do anything similar to what we're doing in terms of medical advice, therapy, diagnostics, anything, I, I strongly encourage you to, to, to reach out and to explore these services and opportunities because honestly, what do you, you know, what do you have to lose? Uh, you know, this is a free service of experts whose job is to help you navigate the NHS and get con connect you with the people that you need to be connected with to make your, your mission a success. Um, so uh, I strongly support um, what everyone else has said to go out and give it a try. And also use the opportunity to thank you guys for the work that you're doing. It's been really useful. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a great uh, great background uh, into it, George. I mean, I think the the NH, the NHR was it started? How long ago was, did it did it all start, James? Um, when, when was the NHR? Because it was About 2006, 2007. Right. And and how much? Is, and how much is funded every year again? How much comes in? It, it varies a little bit, but it's about 1.2 billion pounds per year. Yeah. And how does it um, how does it differ to other countries? I mean, have, have any of you had any experience of going into other countries with trying to set up trials? And, and uh, you know, I, mean, I know we've all said, you know, and I, Michael said it repeatedly that the NHS is a is a very uh, fragmented you know, organization. But I think that having traveled a lot um, and particularly to America, where I know that there are hundreds of different payer systems, and we've really got one pair system, although it's fragmented. I think it's, sometimes it's unfair to say it's difficult, whereas some of the healthcare systems in the world are, do have these multiple structures and insurance companies to deal with. But, but have you, uh, Michael, have you had any experience of, of trying to do research in other countries as well? Yes, I've been doing projects in, um, in Singapore and in Brazil, primarily. We've been running a study in Brazil for, with the Incor Hospital. Uh, in Brazil and with the hypertension unit using the avatar system. And it's been fantastic. But time and time again, what they're interested in is, is connecting also to the UK, the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. And NIHR is known in Brazil and it has a very, very good reputation. So one of the things that I'm focusing on now is to connect the opportunities we have in the NHS with other world leading hospitals so that we have an international network but I think that NIHR has, has set a very high standard and the other hospitals want to work to that type of standard because of the ability to connect universities, industry uh, for patient, to measure patient benefit and, and clinical benefit uh, is, is excellent. And so I, I just want to thank the team and James and the team because they've been so helpful uh, and, and reaching out and very knowledgeable of the market. So I just want to thank them for the help. Oh, that's nice of you to say. We do have some questions, actually. Um, Gareth's asked, is the i for i funding only for British-based companies, or could subsidiaries branch offices for companies who have a presence in the UK but are headquartered and manufactured elsewhere also apply? Yeah, that's one for you, James, I think. Sure. So it, I guess it depends on the perspective you take. So it's not exclusively for British-based or English-based uh, companies but you do depending on the nature of the award you're looking for you will need collaborators anyway and I think it's probably true to say with a lot of NHR funding if you have an England-based collaborator it does tend to have to be England but that's not always true EMI for example is a UK-wide program and um, that allows you to be eligible to apply so it really is a bit of a case-by-case -case, um, basis I think. Yeah okay okay that's uh, that's interesting I've got some people asking um how how to contact a relevant NIHR and I suppose when you look to that sort of uh, fantastic slide you had of all the different um, particularly the uh, the medtech in vitro collaboratives or which used to be called the DEX and I know they've changed the acronyms a bit over the years but um, but would you suggest they just go straight through uh, your your office James? Yeah so I think it's important to say that Obviously, people can go direct to each individual um, MIC or BRC, or there are many other parts of the research landscape of NHR funds we haven't mentioned, like applied research collaboratives as well. Um, but if they want a streamlined approach to access all of that in one go, then NOCRI really is the best place to do it. And 
the people in those centers are used to getting emails from us with industry inquiries. So they're far more perhaps attentive to us as a team sending inquiries in um, because they expect them when we send them out, you know, on a daily basis. Sure, sure. No, no, no problem. Um, question for you, Michael, how much time do you think it's saved, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, um, you know, going through the NIHR in terms of setting up your studies? How, how long, how, how much time do you think it saved you in your, in your strategy? For me, I mean, one, I had worked in the NHS for 10 years and I started working in Brazil and Singapore because there the clinicians wanted to say yes. And I was slightly fearful of starting uh, work in the NHS, thinking, oh, and having worked in the NHS, how complicated it, it was. But what happened when I approached NIHR and they have this platform, um, everything unfolded so fast. And the clinicians are very, very eager and very entrepreneurial too wanting, the, the, the motivation is to see a patient benefit in clinical transformation and to use the technologies to transform their services and to help the patients is their motivation. So things move very, very fast. And there's lots of funding sources available in the UK from uh, NIHR, which was mentioned, but Innovate UK and Department of Health, Health has other funding. And then we have European funding available and so on. So it, um, it's a great service. I mean, it really, really is. And I would encourage anybody from the US, I'm originally from Wisconsin or anywhere else in the world to, to go to NIHR, use their platform and start engaging with, uh, with the NHS. And what are NIHR trying to do? They're trying to improve healthcare for people in, uh, in, in the UK. And so if an innovation comes from another country and delivers value and benefit, the NIHR would be interested in this. That's, that's really good to hear. So James, in the in the light of sort of COVID, I know, um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of things going on with uh, hospitals um, recently. What, what sort of impact has that had in the last, um, you know, year from, from the trial perspective for, for the NHR? Sure. So you've probably seen in the news, the NHR has been instrumental in setting up the COVID platforms, uh, recovery being probably the most famous that identified dexamethasone as the treatment for uh, COVID-19. So there's lots and lots of things NHR has done to support the assessment of therapeutics and other interventions to support. There have been calls out on looking at long COVID just before Christmas and you know, vaccine studies the NHR has been, and particularly the clinical research network as the delivery component has been instrumental in setting that up. If you look at the mix as examples, um, the trauma mix, the, the professor that, that leads that um, was heavily involved in the ventilator challenge back in sort of, I guess, March, April, May time. The surgical MIC was very involved in the PPE um, requirements that were needed due to shortages back then. So it's been heavily involved across the board. I'm probably doing a disservice here to the BRCs and all the input um, that they've had. There are certainly lots of studies that have run out of things like Leicester BRC, FOSP study, um, for example, that you may have heard in the New Southampton has done a lot of respiratory work as well. And through a translational research collaboration that NOCRI supports, um, the respiratory one has lots of input from BRCs across the country. They've come together to support studies and, and you know, early interventions like therapeutics that might be helpful. What we see now, which might be relevant to the companies listening, is that there was certainly as NHR has published uh, a pause in research, there was the restart program that was published last year that's now moving to recovery and growth. Um, and there's change in the capacity in the system to engage, depending on what kind of needs you have and who you're looking to find. Um, the early phase infrastructure, so particularly the mix and the BRCs, they tend to be a little bit more um, free in terms of capacity at the moment to engage with companies as well. And we did see a little slowdown, I think, due to the second wave and over Christmas, but things are picking back up again. So it really depends on what you're looking for. But if it is earlier phase, that expertise and input into design of technologies and studies, then that, that's been fairly consistently strong now since probably about June of last year. That's really encouraging to hear. I mean, where do you see the NIHR in sort of the next five years on the back of this? I, I mean, I, I, I've just seen, you know, great growth and expansion in these, um, you know, particularly the, uh, the, the MedTech in vitro collaboratives. And I've worked with, I think, three or four of them. I mean, Cambridge uh, with a device that I worked uh, with in the stroke space, um, Newcastle uh, with the uh, diagnostic side. I mean, a lot of work in Birmingham with the trauma, uh, you know, out of a QEH um, 
and then Oxford, in fact, I was invited to lecture at the Oxford um, uh, diagnostic one, um, uh, which, which they run really good courses. I don't know if they still do them, but they were doing some really good courses around, um, you know, how to, how to put the value around uh, uh, diagnostic uh, technologies. But, um, but is there, you know, talk of expansion in the light of the success of all the work you've done in COVID? It, it's a good question. So I think the things that we're looking as an organization to adopt as a result of COVID are changes in trial design and a more flexible approach, perhaps more relevant for, say, larger pharma and CROs. But I think that can actually be adopted across the board. Um, there's a big drive looking at complex and innovative designs, you know, and I guess platforms like recovery where they were adapted to new approaches because it is a more efficient method of doing clinical research. From the MIC perspective, this is true of a lot of infrastructure as well. They are effectively run on a com competition basis. So every five years, the funding cycle comes up. Some of those have been extended because of uh, the impact of COVID. But the Department of Health and Social Care asks all parts of uh, the NHR to feed into those and look for where there's good evidence of impact as to try and, I guess, uh, support investment and, and expansion. So it, it's possible. I unfortunately don't know the answer and, and don't make the decisions, but it's possible that because of the work that they do, particularly the mix that that, that is expanded, it's probably worth mentioning that the money that goes into BRCs is, is greater and the mix probably adds a significant amount of value um, to the system for what is a, uh, a more moderate investment. Yeah, well, that's, that's encouraging to hear. Um, if any of you got any, uh, any of the uh, people listening, if you've got any questions, please, please ask in the chat box. I, I think, you know, I, I'm just sitting and remembering the, the times that the uh, NOCRI and the NOHR have really helped um, my clients. And I, I can, I think the most memorable one of all was um, we had a, a company with a device in the space of stroke detection and um, through the uh, connections with the with Nokri, we we went um, up to uh, Newcastle and uh, we walked in the room. We, we did, did arrange for these people to get together to to, to listen and find out about this technology. And um, uh, we walked in this room and and it was there was about fifteen people that were really high level professors and uh, interventional uh, neuro neurologists and uh, um, you know. It was astonishing that that that, that they were all in this room uh, with tea and biscuits, ready to hear what we had to had to show, and that, and that's so unusual because um, you know I, I spent uh, you know twenty odd years introducing prior to working for device access um, technologies into the NHS from gastric banding to lots of endolaparoscopic products, and obviously the one that Michael uh, I met Michael through was when I I was running. Uh, uh, Venus Medical Technologies, a new tech for treating varicose veins, but it's very difficult to get busy people together in a room mm. uh, like that, and and to have them all there on time in a room, interested and receptive and yeah. and briefed about what the technology was. Um, really, uh, you know, I, I never forget that day because you know normally in a normal journey of of uh, market access, and you know we all know that that a lot of this work is 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 from. You know, getting the clinician on board and getting that clinical champion of which, you know, Nokri and the NRH have, have great access to these leading experts. Um, you know, that, that sort of time scale involved, and particularly this particular company was a US based company with mm. uh, people in, in California. And, and, you know, they can't make 15 trips to the UK to meet 15 people in the same hospital. And mm. I think that's really. Um, you know that, that that particular journey ended up in some research funding and and that's ongoing at the moment it's very exciting what's going on there but i think that's the thing it's it's that it it's it's the ability um to come in at the nhs level to be able to pull people together uh, and of course now i think you know that was when we could meet physically in, in rooms and, uh, and eat biscuits and drink tea and stuff but these days you know this whole virtual world is 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 really uh it's exciting in many ways that we're doing this now and uh mike you're uh, you've got a question i think no just a comment on this i think that one of the things that might surprise people from overseas is that in the nhs uh well one in ten people that are employed in in the uk actually work for the nhs it's the biggest employer in uh, in the uk and over a million of those people who are employed are clinicians and scientists. And through NIHR, what happens is that it's very much part of the culture of the whole brand of the NHS. 
uh, continuous education and training and research uh, and evidence-based practice. And so if you go to any hospital in the, in the UK, up and down the country, they will know about the NIHR and they will feel that it's part of who they are. And I think that's a really important point about the culture. No, that's that's really, really great to hear. Um, a number of people are asking um, for copies of the uh, of this webinar at the end, which um, we will be uh, putting on Spotify. Um, we'll probably put it on YouTube because I think it's uh, it's nice. We've not done uh, we device access for loads of these sort of webinars. We've, we've, we've had some fantastic uh, folk on uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Dame Barbara Haken, uh, who was the uh, deputy uh, uh, Deputy Chief of, of the NHS um, uh, earlier, well, sort of last summer, and, and we did a really good um, webinar on NICE as well, where we brought um, NICE along to talk about evidence requirements, which which we, we've had, you know, I think over 500 downloads of that on YouTube. So we will put this on, um, and, and I think in particular, the slides about the infrastructure, um, you know, I know there was a lot that you showed there, James, but um, we'll make those available um, I don't know if you wanted to, to, to show your contact details again, uh, James, I'm happy to, to, to hand over to you if you wanted to share those, but, but uh, yeah, um, I think uh, it's, it's, been, it's been really good um, having everybody on this today um, uh, and uh, any sort of closing remarks from anyone? I'd just uh, put my uh, email in the chat. So I'd encourage anybody, if you've got questions, please do get in touch. Um, I think Marcus, Michael and George are testament to how well the service can work. As they've mentioned, it's all free. It's all been really positive for them. Marcus and George have not only found the collaborators, but also put together collaborations that have been successful in funding. So, you know, it's, it's a really possible pathway that, that companies can, can go down. Well, that's great. Um, well, uh, I've got no other further questions, but um, I've really enjoyed, uh, uh, I know this has been a long time in the planning um, uh, to, to get everybody together and really greatly appreciate everybody's uh, contribution today uh, to this uh, webinar. And um, yeah, I wish you uh, all luck with your developments, Marcus, um, uh, Michael and George, with what you're developing, uh, you know, exciting developments with your, your products there. And um, just want to say thank you to everyone uh, for joining and for the participants today and um yeah look out for the next one thank you very much michael thanks so just